All right, boys and girls. So we are on to chapter three. So we um, left off with Jason was pretty upset that he wasn't in Lupe and Mia's class. But you have kind, sweet Mia, you know, giving him a pat on the back and being like, hey, we'll still see each other at recess. So let's see what happens in chapter three. You'll notice in the right hand side is your chapter three vocabulary. Reluctantly, collective, mimicked, and buffoon. So think about those words as I'm reading them. What's the context that they're in? What events are happening? Who's saying those things? What's happening again? And things to think about as we're reading. If you were Mia, how would you feel about having Mrs. Welsh as your teacher? So obviously you're gonna be introduced to her teacher, new for the year. And have you ever held a grudge against someone? And does it impact you or the other person more? And if you're not sure what a grudge is, see if you can figure that out as I'm reading this chapter, okay? Chapter three. Ten minutes later, Lupe and I found our new classroom way in the back of the school, except it wasn't a classroom. It was an air-conditioned trailer. Hesitantly, Lupe and I opened the door to the trailer, thinking there must be some kind of mistake. But a thin white woman gestured for us to come in. So we did. I'm Mrs. Welsh, the woman said. Please take a seat. She pointed to the desks where rows of similarly confused looking students sat. I recognized Bethany Britt, the girl who had made fun of my math last year. Bethany rolled her eyes at me. Clearly, she was thrilled to see me too. I walked over to the two empty desks way on the other side of the room, far, far away from Bethany. As Lupe and I set our things down, Mrs. Welsh made an <clears throat> sound. Sorry, but you can't sit with your friends, Mrs. Welsh said, shaking her head. She pointed at Lupe and motioned for her to take the seat next to Bethany's instead. Sit here. As Lupe reluctantly moved her stuff over to the other side of the room, I sat at my desk, my jaw clenching in frustration. Good morning, class. Mrs. Welsh had a tight brown bun on her head, like her hair had been pulled back with a vacuum cleaner. Her cheekbones were razor sharp, and she forced her paper-thin lips into a stiff smile as she scanned the room. Good morning, Mrs. Welsh, we replied. You're probably wondering why we're in a trailer, she said. I looked around the room. Several kids were nodding. One was asleep, and another kid was scratching his head and smelling his fingers. Well, the classroom we were supposed to be in had a little water damage. We were hoping to fix it over the summer, but unfortunately, due to budget cuts, her voice trailed off. There was another phrase we'd heard a lot this summer, due to budget cuts. There was a collective groan in the classroom, which Mrs. Welsh cut short with a clap of her hands. Right, then, we're not going to dwell on that. Get out your pencils. We are going to start the year off by writing a little reflection. I sat up very straight. Yes, I was dying to get back to writing. The reports for the paper investors were fun, but I longed for the freedom and challenge of fiction. I'm sure you've all heard about the gubernatorial race. Gubernatorial race, she said. Gubana what? Stuart in the back asked. A few kids laughed. Gubernatorial, Mrs. Welch repeated. We all just giggled harder. Except Lupe. Her head was down and she was drawing in her sketch pad. Mrs. Welch wrote G-U-B-E-R-N-A-T-O-R-I-A-L on the board. But still, we couldn't pronounce it. She finally had to ditch it and go with the word governor instead. Governor Wilson is running for re-election, she said. One of the things he's running on is immigration. Do you guys know what immigration means? I raised my hand. It's when someone comes to this country from another country. Mrs. Welsh frowned. Yes, but please wait until you are called on before speaking next time. She scolded me. This is the sixth grade. You need to follow the rules. I felt my cheeks turn hot. 
Bethany Brett raised her hand and blurted out, I heard it cost the state of California $1.5 billion just to take care of immigrants. That's right, Mrs. Welch said. She nodded at Bethany, pleased. Someone's been paying attention to the news. I couldn't believe it. Mrs. Welsh had just snapped at me for not waiting to be called on before speaking, and when Bethany did it, she was all jazz hands and dancing fingers. I shook my head and stared at the glued-on wooden walls of our trailer classroom. Sixth grade was off to some start. At recess, Jason walked up to me and Lupe. We were talking about Mrs. Welsh. Can you believe that woman? I asked Lupe. She yelled at me in the first five minutes of class. And she made us write about immigration, Lupe added. She mimicked Mrs. Welsh's voice. Write your true feelings. There are no right or wrong answers. Yeah, right. Writing already? On the first day? Jason shuddered. We just sat around and introduced ourselves. For the entire morning? I asked. Oh, yeah. You'd be amazed how long you can stretch that out, Jason grinned. At least a morning, sometimes even an entire day. I chuckled. It sounded like he was feeling better about his class. Then he turned to me and asked, Hey, so you want to come over to my house after school next Friday and hang out? I glanced over at Lupe, who was jiggling her head from side to side like a Chinese rattle drum. But I remember the disappointment on Jason's face that morning when he found out we weren't in the same class. Sure, I said slowly. We're free next Friday, right, Lupe? She shot me a look. I think I have to help my dad out with something, she muttered. How about you, Mia? Jason asked eagerly. I, um, oh, come on. It's going to be so awesome. Wait till you see my house. I've come to your house. I've been to your house, I reminded him. Last year, when we first met your dad, and his dad tricked us into working at the motel for practically free. Yeah, but not as, you know, his voice trailed off. I shook my head. As what? Jason blushed. As a friend. Aw. I looked over at Lupe, who had, excuse me while I go throw up, written on her face. But was it really so bad to be friends with him? Sure, Jason was a world-class buffoon last year, but can't hold... You can't hold something against someone forever, can you? Okay, I said. How was school? My parents asked when I walked into the motel that afternoon. My mom set down a plate of tomato and egg, my favorite, while my dad scooped a generous helping of rice for me. I smiled. Now that my parents could take breaks whenever they wanted, they could sit down with me while I had my snack, which was more like a meal. Though I got free lunch at school, it usually wasn't enough, and my belly was rumbling by the time I got home. Good, I said, picking up my chopsticks. The chopsticks kept falling apart in my hands, so I ditched them for a fork. As I ate, I told my parents about my new teacher and how we'd gotten off to a rocky start, but that it would be okay since I was going to win her over with my writing. That's the spirit, my mom said. She looked over to my dad, but he was too busy staring at my hand. You're eating rice with a fork? he asked. I blushed and quickly switched to a spoon. Was that a better utensil? Dad smiled a little. I ate the rest of my food quietly. As I cleared the plates and tossed my unused chopsticks in the sink, I wondered why it mattered so much to Dad what I used to eat with, so long as I got the food in my mouth. And that's the end of chapter three. So was anybody able to figure out what a grudge meant? And think about those questions that we have up there.